So, God tough love. Actually, I think that is appropriate. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Jenia, Nitya, Batman, Alok, Harry Krishna, Joaquin, Kaupataru, iPhone, Madhuri Kapoor, please turn your cameras on so I can see you. Thank you. So um, I don't think it would be proper to call this Krishna stuff love because Krishna is, is quite kind. Uh, God stuff love, yes, that, that is pretty tough. Like, for example, in Christianity, for minor offenses, you can end up burning forever. So that's, that's pretty tough love. Uh, and it's not like you, you have a chance to come back and make up for the mistake. You're just, you just burn. Matter of fact, I, I remember selling Srila Prabhupada's books in, uh, in areas of the Bible Belt. Um, of course, Houston is kind of right below the Bible Belt. But, um, uh, and people will give me brochures where there were images of, uh, of a very old man with no face, long white hair, sitting on a throne among the clouds, dispensing justice to people who committed uh, minor offenses. I mean, you can call them sins, like someone bit from a wrong apple, you know, just ended up at the wrong tree and, and somehow or other will, will have a eternal damnation and hellish fire burning forever. That is, that is really tough love. What do you learn from that? Particularly if you're not coming back, if you don't have a second chance. In the, as far as I understand, and I'm not a Bible scholar, but in the Bible, there was, uh, there was some political moves, especially in the year 319 on uh, the Council of Nicaea, where Constantine was, it was like a big preaching move where you can convert the emperor into a Christian. So they had to make some concessions. The concession was, that they would eliminate certain things like vegetarianism and reincarnation and things like that. Because reincarnation make people lazy. And if you know you have another chance, why bother? You know, just wait until, you know, procrastinate a little bit. And next time around, you know, you can, you can correct your mistakes. Or if that doesn't work, you know, wait a couple of lifetimes. So we cannot afford to to wait that long because we don't know exactly what's going to happen with us i mean our mind is very feeble and it's very attracted to this material world so we may become enamored just like uh, just like uh, men and women tend to fall in love with each other and they do stupid things because they in the name of love as uh, it's, it's not i'm not blaming infatuation here but Things could happen that because of our mental weakness, we, we make uh, bad decisions. And I don't know if maybe I'm talking to the wrong kind of audience. You guys never made a bad decision before, but I, I, I certainly am not, I'm not in the, that category. So in order to, to make the right decisions, we have to be Krishna conscious because, um, there's very little that we can do without help. This is just like when you take math in high school or, or even elementary school. Sometimes it doesn't get through your head. So you need a, not just a teacher. You need your parents to help. And then a tutor. And then some, some other student that comes and helps you uh, with the homework. So Krishna is constantly sending tutors and brothers and sisters and parents and you know he tries again and again life after life to get us through this you know arithmetic this this calculus of living in the material world and we don't get it right we we get it wrong and then we get nervous and when we take the exam we we don't pass because the final exam is everybody gets the same i mean it's um you know what the exam is it's, it's not like when you're in school, they always change the questions, they lock it up and they change the questions that everybody gets, you know, there are four types of uh, exams and you get 
I could either one, two, three, or four. And so you can't copy from a guy or the girl next to you because they have a different type of exam. But the final exam for us is all the same. It's uh, at the time of death. Uh, have you done your homework? Have you actually gotten to the point that you want to uh, be with Krishna and you had enough of the material world? So the test, the, the, the tough love, as they call, is simply practice, is tutoring. Is, this is, is, is tough, but you have to prepare for the final exam. So how are we doing? I mean, if we, are we introspective enough? Are we taking count of what we have done so far and we are satisfied? Like, let's say you may have met uh, a Krishna conscious person, a really good advanced devotee. So if you balance yourself, if you compare yourself with that kind of level, how are you doing? Have you made progress? Have you actually, if, if you started practicing, you, you start chanting and doing sarana bhakti, you, you do you know, all the devotional service that you can accrue, but have you made enough advancement that at the time of death, you're not going to be troubled by, by being in this, uh, in, in this conundrum, which is, is very difficult. Uh, at the time of death, it's, it's described that uh, it's hard to breathe. Well, eventually you won't, but uh, while you're taking your last breath, you know, the previous one to the last breath are not easy either. And then you may have uh, serious pain. And pain makes people forget who they are, where they are, what's going on. It, it's it's uh, terrifying. Like, for example, I don't want to be morbid here and make, you know, scare people. But let's say you're at the dentist and you're getting a, a root canal or some horrible stuff like that. And inadvertently, the dentist uh, touches the nerve with one of his tools. Um, what... Do you remember at the time? I mean, besides the pain, can you, can you put together that you're thinking, oh, well, he is actually helping me. He's actually trying to um, the, remove the damaged nerve so my, my tooth will be okay. Or you're cursing the dentist and all his ancestry at the time and just thinking about the pain only. So imagine that uh, the pain multiply many times at the time of death. It's difficult to think of anything because you're suffering so much. You're barely, um, barely alive, literally. You're, you're just, your organs are failing uh, or it may be due to a car accident where you have a fraction of a second. Are you, not, are you gonna be Krishna conscious? Therefore, this tough law, this training is, for you to actually get that muscle memory that you need to remember Krishna at the time of death. So it's not evil, like, you know, this idea of God is punishing us all and making us miserable because he's a sadistic uh, type of God. We, we just, we're just losers and God is sadistic. And if you don't do exactly as he tells you, you're going to burn forever. This is, this is not the idea. Krishna is actually trying to train us up. So at the time that we leave this material world, the attachments that we have, just like uh, sometimes I give the example, uh, let's say you put a Band-Aid, you, know, you cut yourself you know, on your arm where you have some hair and you put a Band-Aid and then eventually coagulates and the, the wound closes up and then it's over. You just have to remove the Band-Aid, but you have a lot of hair underneath it. So if you pull it slowly, it's, it's going to be painful. If you pull it all at once, it's going to be painful. No matter what you do, it's going to be painful. But, but the wound is cured, it's healed. So at the time of death, basically, it's like a gigantic band-aid that we have to pull with all the attachments that we, that we get. And it, it hurts like hell. Sure, it hurts. And do we have to, but we have to be healed by the time that is removed, that when the body is taken away from us. We have to be completely cured. That's why the tough love. God is 
Krishna is very kind. As he doesn't want to utilize that. That's the last resort. But somehow or other, because we don't understand that this is not our home, we want to just stick around. We want to stay here. Imagine, imagine you get the keys for, for, a, for an apartment and uh, you're told, okay, here it is. This is your apartment. Uh, you can have it um, for two weeks. That's it, two weeks. Don't make plans. Don't make long-term plans. Don't invest money. Don't paint it. Don't buy furniture. Don't buy accoutrements and kitchen equipment. You're living in two weeks. So here is the same example. You get a body, which is actually a human body. That's a very rare thing. That's very rare. Uh, human bodies are not so uh, common, actually, because they're millions of insects and billions, trillions of insects and other, you know, aquatics and uh, birds and all sorts of animals. So humans, not that many, not that many. And out of these humans, uh, maybe one out of many, many thousands may endeavor to understand who am I? Is there a God? Why do I suffer? How come there is death? So there is one out of many, many thousands. And out of those who are inquisitive, um, not so many pursue it to, to the, you know, make a long time career out of that. They basically uh, have a few existential questions when, you know, mid youth or old age, and that's it. That's, that's your quota. Uh, so out of those rare souls that actually inquire about self-realization, maybe one of them pursues it, uh, pursues it a little longer. And out of those who actually endeavor, it's rare to find one who is self-realized, fully self-realized. Krishna says that in, in the Bhagavad Gita. It's right there, black and white. So uh, when one comes in contact with one of these self-realized souls, one has to take full advantage. One has to learn the script as is, not uh, bring, my, well, yeah, that sounds nice, but my philosophy is such and such. There was an, an occasion where Srila Prabhupada was um, talking to Hari Kesh, then Hari Kesh the Swami. Uh, he was, I think he was his secretary at the time. Um, so Prabhupada consulted with him and said, so um, I'm thinking about doing this or that, and what do you think? And Hari Kesh Maharaj said, Prabhupada, you're the one with a brain here. Uh, whatever you think is fine. And then Prabhupada says, that's very nice, but you know, what do you think? And Harika said, Prabhupada, I, I don't know anything. I'm a, I'm a fool, I'm an ignorant person. Uh, I, you're a self-realized soul. You're, you're you know, Krishna's your most confidential servant. Whatever you decide, that's way better, what I, whatever I can say. Prabhupada said, yes, that's a proper attitude to have, but I, I'm interested in your opinion. And Harikesh went on and said, Prabhupada, I have no opinion. I am, I'm just a fool. I don't know anything. And Prabhupada said, okay, okay, that's nice. But, but really, really, what do you think? And Harikesh said, well, actually, and Prabhupada said, aha, so you do have your opinion. You do have your opinion. So this is, this is what happens. We, we learn from those who are advance we learn from those who are saints and sages but we still hold on to our little opinion like yeah but if we do it this way it's probably better so we always have a better idea than than god we always have a better idea than than the saints and and the uh, avatars we we already figured it out so it's difficult to teach someone who is not hearing properly because you're here into your own mind, your own intelligence, your own ego is always talking to you. And when someone tells the truth, those other sounds obscure the sound of transcendence. So that's why Krishna has to sometimes slap us a little and wake up. You're, you're not hearing me properly. So I'm going to 
I'm going to turn up the heat a little bit. You know, I'm going to boil the milk with you just for your own sake. I'm going to make burfi out of your, out of your milk. So we may not like it, you know, it may burn a little bit, but it's for our own good because we are actually uh, endeavoring to, um, how do you say, to, to get our mind to be the ultimate decider. And I don't know your experience, but our minds usually tend out doing the wrong thing. At the end, we have to start over again. It's like someone who's driving. Um, there is there is a fashionable place. I don't know downtown Houston or wherever it is. And there is a guy with a with a car, a lower low to the ground, and you know chrome everywhere, and lights, and you know great suspension, and you know has expensive clothes and gold and glasses and so on. And he's waving at everybody. You know, look at me. But he's going in the wrong direction. It's going towards a dead end street. So eventually we'll have to turn around and go by the same place, kind of sunk in these seats in humiliation and embarrassment. You know, oops, you know, I went the wrong way. So this is, this is what we tend to do. We tend to obey our mind and our senses and get the wrong, get, go in the wrong direction. And then it's, uh, it's a little embarrassing to have to admit, oh, really, I don't know anything. Matter of fact, in, in Greece, where the, the birthplace of democracy, uh, Socrates, as he was uh, about to drink hemlock, the poison that finally killed him, uh, that's, by the way, that's one of the dangers of democracy that it may kill you. Um, he actually um, said the only thing that he's, you know, they were expecting the wisest the wisdom to come out in the last moments of his life. You know, this, this was the, the most intelligent person, the most saintly person in all of Athens and all of the Greek empire. And they expected wise words to come out of him. And he said, the only thing I know is that I don't know anything. I don't know anything. So that's a very good platform to begin to learn. If we think we know, then there's very, there's very little room for improvement. Uh, so this is how, again, God's tough love comes in. It's just to wake us up and tell us, no, you don't know everything. You're not doing everything right. You're listening to your mind a little too much. So there is a method of purification. Of course, in, in each age, it's a different method. But ultimately, the method is the same. It's to uh, fall in love with God, fall in love with Krishna, and through the holy names, it's, it's very easy. It's very easily done in this age. So uh, at that point, I would like to get some questions and comments and reflections from all of you. And eventually we'll actually chant together. Truly really nice. Is that okay, Winston? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We've got some questions in the chat. Um, Jenya asks, if a true devotee only worships the highest God, what is the purpose of demigods and lower gods? I don't see that. Um, it's all the way at the top. At the top in the chat? Mm -hmm. I just see... Oh, sorry, this what? is a private question, not a private chat. Oh, private. Okay, go ahead, say it again. Jenny asks, if a true devotee only worships the highest God, what is the purpose of demigods and lower gods? Uh, well, there is a purpose, but the Bhagav Bhagavatam, the Srimad Bhagavatam, definitely discourages the worship of demigods. Matter of fact, uh, there is a verse, Kamas Tais Tair Drita Gana Prapadyanti Devata, the demigods, uh, those who are foolish worship demigods. The thing is, it's a quick turnaround. It's like the Amazon Prime of, uh, of wishes. You know, with the demigods, you get you get the, your goodies the next day, and with Krishna, you may have to struggle, and and you get it, you get it on the you know, like sending something by boat from India. It may may take a while, and it may not come in the shape that you desire, but it, it will be for your for your uh, improvement. 
In other words, Krishna will give you what you pray for, uh, but in a, if it is not good for you, it will give it to you in a way that you will never ask for that again. He will, uh, it will mess you up royally, and uh, you will understand this. This is not what I really need. This is not what I really wanted. So, uh, in the Bhagavatam, it's, it's curious how they depict the, the demigods in a in a funny light, almost. You know that everybody's fumbling and making mistakes. Even Indra, you know, Indra messed it mess it up royally during uh, the Govardhan Leela. He he thought he could eliminate the entire population of Vrindavan. And there he got a little child with his pinky finger of his left hand, which is supposed to be, you know, if you're right-handed, it's your weakest hand. And the pinky finger is the weakest finger. And he lifted an entire hill and protected the inhabitants. So he, Indra understood, ooh, even me, the king of heaven, can make mistakes. Lord Brahma also, with the Brahma Bimohana Leela, he kidnapped the calves and the coward boys and came back a year later. Of course, Lord Brahma lives for 311 trillion years, so he has a short attention span when it comes to things. You know, when, when he came back, it was a year had passed already. Uh, it, that's why, for example, when Hiranya Kashipu uh, performed austerities um, to get some boon, from Lord Brahma, it took him thousands of years, you know, but he, eventually he's, he kept his life air within his bones when a big gigantic anthill kind of ate his body. And Lord Brahma came back after thousands of years because, you know, a day of Brahma is 400, 4,320,000 years, uh, million years. So, you know, it was a moment for Brahma, but it was a long time for Hirani Kashipu. So even Lord Rama made, made a mistake, and he's, he's the most intelligent, and he has a lot of heads, so, he, so many, many heads thinking, and still he made mistakes. And what to speak of the other demigods? They, they constantly mess up. So you can, and, and if anything happens that, you know, that is without, you know, beyond the purview uh, of the power of the demigods, they always have to go to Lord Brahma, and Lord Brahma has to go to the to Swetadvi, to the ocean, to the shore of the ocean of milk, and pray to Lord Vishnu, and Lord Vishnu has to solve everything. So this is this is how it works. You can work, you know, work with the demigods, but you, you're not gonna get out. They they don't get out when the devastation comes. They don't get out of the material world alive. Uh, they don't have immortality. They can't give power without asking uh, Vishnu for power. They, they are basically, um, what's the use of the demigods? The demigods are devotees. They are, they are very advanced people. Uh, but they actually have a lifespan too. They die. Eventually they die. They, have, they pray to come to the earth where they have a short lifespan where there is no much pleasure, no much pain, and uh, they can get out quickly, you know, and think of Krishna at the time of time of death. So this is, uh, you you have to go to the, you know, you have to get the middle men out of the way, basically. Demigods, you know, with all due respect, and they are very nice, but they can't give you what Krishna can give you. Mm. Thank you. Devlina asks, can chanting the holy names constantly help improve our attention and reduce the opinions in our mind? Um, well, that depends on how attentive you are. Hmm. Uh, there are 10 offenses to chanting the holy name, of which the most important is actually the 11th, to, to be uh, attentive while chanting. Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur calls it pramada. Pramada means madness. That's how he defines that offense. If you are actually, if, if Krishna comes to you, let's say you're, all of a sudden you're just, you know, watching a YouTube video and somebody knocks at the door and you open the door and it's Krishna, you know, full regalia, peacock feather, flute, you know, 
beautiful smile, reddish eyes, the whole thing. Um, what do you do? He said, I'm sorry, you know, give me a second. I'm, I'm really fine. I'm watching this uh, cat video on YouTube. It's really funny. I'll be right back. Just, just don't go away. You don't do that. If Krishna shows up, you just forget whatever you're doing and take care of him. So all of a sudden, here we are chanting Krishna's name, which is non-different from Krishna. And we are thinking about a cat video or about some other stupid stuff. So if the more you chant, the better you get at it. It's like anything. Like let's say you, you play a sport. I I grew up in a table tennis uh royalty, you know, more or less. My family, they all play, they're all uh ranked players, cousins, father, brothers, they all had training and so on. But when you begin, you need at least ten thousand hours of playing. That's a long time. That's years. 10,000 hours, and then you can actually improve. They can actually, instead of, you know, uh, not understanding things, you're just thinking about strategy, just like learning how to drive a car, uh, if, especially a stick shift. If you learn from the beginning, well, there's a lot of stuff to take a, to pay attention to. Uh, they say, you know, you have to change uh, shift gears at the right speed, so you may have to look at the odometer uh, and uh, speedometer, and then you have to look at the rear view mirror, and you have to look in front of you, and you have to look at the traffic signs, and you have to coordinate the, the brake and the clutch, and uh, you have to go at, at the right speed because they're, I mean, there's so much stuff. There's so much stuff going on. But Eventually, when you learn how to drive, you're only thinking about where you're going. You're not thinking about all the other mechanical stuff that you got under your belt. So chanting is more or less uh, an activity where you have to actually uh, learn the basics, the mechanics of it, and how to control your mind. So the mind will be chattering no matter what you do. So and and it's as difficult to control the mind by uh, by mistreating the mind. One one thing is indulging, like we all do, that we let the mind just run amok. And another thing is to be too draconian, to to have you know to be cruel to the mind and say you know shut up, I don't want to listen to you. The mind won't won't listen to either way. So what you have to do. It's like what you do to, to a child, for example. Uh, the child is at the edge of a building, uh, a skyscraper, and said, you know, um, I think if I had an umbrella, I could jump from a 25th floor and land safely on the ground. But that's, that's a child speaking. He doesn't understand exactly what's going on. So you, you, you can't chain the kid to his bed for the rest of his life until he grows up. He, you just have to tell him, you know, that's a great idea. I don't think it's going to work. Uh, we can think about it and talk about it later. So that's how you treat your mind. Um, as you're chanting, the mind is going to say, oh, you know, why don't you go to the refrigerator? Why don't you open the computer? Why don't you check your email? How about your Facebook page? How about Instagram? You know, this would be a great idea and blah, blah, blah. But you, you're supposed to be chanting. So what you have to do is say, um, that is a great idea, whatever it is that you, you're coming up with. Uh, that's a great idea. But we're, we're going to wait until we're done chanting, and then, then we're going to talk about it, okay? And if it happens again, then you do it again, and you figure out a way to go around. Of course, the more you chant, the more you listen, the less you hear your mind. The mind becomes kind of a, like a background noise. Because Maya is there to tempt you, but not to break you. Uh, the, the tempting is the idea of uh, getting some good spiritual exercise where you become actually strong, when you become determined. Because you always have a choice. You have to choose the right thing every time. But it's difficult because the mind is always 
the senses are always going in the in the op polar opposite direction. So, can chanting the holy names constantly help improve our attention and reduce the opinions in our mind? Uh, yes, in a sense, it does. But you have to chant properly. You have to do it right, because if you just mutter, you know, you know, guess what? Twenty years later, the same thing will happen. You you made no improvement. That's why I was I was uh, referring to this in the in the very beginning. Like, have you made advancement? Can you see yourself moving? Krishna consciousness goes upwards. So, and there are no notches. This this is not like uh, rock climbing where you have a little you know a little spot and you're looking for the next one, uh, but you're holding on to somewhere. And in Krishna consciousness, you you can, you can go up. Uh, but if you think you're going to stay in one spot and leave uh, uh, based on the laurels that you have accumulated on your fame and on the fumes of your previous devotional service and piety, uh, you're, you're uh, going to have a rude awakening. You're going gonna, to gonna slip back. You're going to slip back. So just keep chanting and try to keep improving. Don't be static. Okay, Batman wrote a question. Are forgiveness and forgetfulness mutually exclusive? Well, no. Um, I remember. I remember somebody um, slapped me in the face. <laughs> this this actually happened uh, many years ago. I was a brahmachari and uh, I didn't care much for uh, social etiquette, so I. I I wanted to do laundry at an improper time in the house of a person that you know wasn't the temple or anything like that, and somebody was there slapping in the face, and um, I forgave her, but I didn't forget. So <laughs> they're, they're different things. I it's not like I, I hold grudges or anything like that, but uh, if you yeah, forgiveness. We should always forgive because I was I was giving a lecture here in Denver, um, and I was speaking about offenses um, because we were speaking about the fourth canto of the Bhagavatam, where Daksha offends severely Lord Shiva so much so, and his wife, Daksha's own daughter, so much so that his daughter decides to cut his her connection with, with her dad by killing herself because you say, you gave me this body, so that's my connection with you, so I'm going to just quit this body. And this, um, so we were, I was talking about the, the subject of uh, forgiveness and, uh, and offenses. And we, we ask, I do pray to Krishna, please forgive me for my offenses. But are we also forgiving others that are so-called offending us? Uh, we should we should actually it should be mutual. It should be not like you know I can do anything, and I don't forgive people. But Krishna, please forgive me. We should actually forgive others. Like the people that actually so called offend us and, and cause trouble to us, they're probably uh, our ticket back to God. It that's how actually can make we can make a lot of advancement in one moment. So these people are buying our ticket back to God. We can't just neglect them or or exclude them from the program. They're actually doing us a favor. And as far as forgetfulness, just get old, you forget everything. Uh, so hopefully not the holy name. As you get older, and some of you may be getting to that age where you start to forget. That is, there's a limited capacity to this to this brain, so eventually it fills up and you can't remember anything. You just have very little, very little left. So forgiveness and forgetfulness, mutually exclusive. You know, they they interact. They are exclusive. They are individual. The most important is to forgive, because Krishna is constantly forgiving you. So you should definitely forgive others. Okay, another question. Um, I hope it's okay. I mean, if 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 I'm wrong or you have any objections, please tell me. I'm, I'm open to disagreement. Can we even begin to imagine how much the pain of death is going to be? 
And are we prepared enough to train our mind to endure that when we leave our body? I had uh, shingles when I, in 2008, and it was very, very painful. I, uh, it was on my face. It was like having a constant headache, earache, toothache, and, and, a, and a knife stabbed into my eye for a couple of months. I suffered from that. And I was trying to understand what is the lesson that I'm learning here, what are I supposed to learn. And um, I, I didn't do very well with pain. I never dealt very well with pain. Uh, I always thought I had a low threshold. And Krishna just decided to give me shingles and raise my threshold of pain. So perhaps at the time of death, I don't get so bewildered. I can actually tolerate a little better what's coming for me. So uh, we all get our tailor-made program. Just like when you go to the gym, you, you meet a trainer, and the trainer doesn't give you the same thing uh, to a person that uh, weighs 98 pounds and a person that weighs 450 pounds. It's, it's different things, different endurance, different bodies different mindsets, etc. So Krishna has, Krishna is our personal trainer and he will make sure that at the time of death, you, you know, you have enough uh, miles under, under your feet that you, you should be able to deal with it. Because Maya won't present a test that you cannot pass. She will always give you something that you can cross. It's up to you. And Krishna will send her to train you and to present another test. So at the time, you know, when, when the trainer gives you uh, a barbell with, you know, 250 pounds and you finally get to lift it, um, guess what? Next week, it's going to put 20 more pounds on it. It's not going to give you less weight. It's going to give you more weight. So when you pass a test of Maya, Maya will come back with a higher test. Okay, good. Now let's go to a higher weight. So don't think that, you know, this is the last thing. So trust me, Krishna is, Krishna is testing you and he's making you stronger and do not refuse it. Do not refuse it because it's for your own good that you pass every single test with flying colors. Okay. This is Harry Krishna. In addition to attentive chanting, reading Srila Prabhupada's books with great care and attention will really help our minds. Yes, I totally agree. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. I go through periods where I read more or read less or don't read. Um, and I definitely benefit when I, when I read the books. I've been actually enjoying very much Srila Prabhupada's Guru's books. Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He uh, has an incredible mind. And there, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. I was reading from the uh, Patramrita, which is a collection of uh, um, Shila Bhakti Siddhanta's letters where he actually gives advice to well-wishers and disciples and so on. And which speaks with scholars and there's another book too. Yeah, very amazing conversations. And you can see he's the vastness of his knowledge, but still is so humble and down to earth and concerned. He's, uh, he's actually, for example, to a disciple whose uh, son, young son passed away. He said, well, Krishna took him away from you, but you actually learn how to relate to your son. So now relate to Krishna as your son, worship Krishna as he was to your son. And, uh, and please forgive me. You, could, you give, you ask me for advice, but I'm, I'm just a fallen materialist. What, what do I know? I mean, that, that level of uh, knowledge and humility is, is astounding. So any of Prabhupada's books, Bhaktisiddhanta's books, the Acharya's books, certainly will soothe our mind and help us in our path. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, can I say something? Please. Um, Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare I really Bo. enjoy your 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 uh, your wisdom. But um, so right now you just said that that um that that person that you referred to referred to Krishna as as his son, right? Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. And to like worship and to kind of see Krishna as his son, right? 
Yes. So I've never heard that before, but I think that really helps me. Um, Cause like, I really admire my dad and I see my dad as a role model. So I can in fact do that. And, Cause it's, you know, coming from a Catholic background, um, I'm still getting used to calling Krishna Lord and getting comfortable. And I'm a lot more comfortable now than in the past, but, but um, you know, if I can see Krishna as like my father, the way I see my father, that would definitely um, grow my relationship. I just, I never thought of it like that. Uh, so if that's in fact true, that, if that's what you're saying, I think that would definitely help me. So yeah, thank you. Um, can I see you? Can you can you turn the camera on? Yeah, I'm, I'm just walking around. Hold on. Oh, okay. Hey. Th thank you. Hi. Well, uh, yeah, Krishna is Krishna, Krishna Pita, Krishna Mata. Uh, Krishna, Krishna is actually the father, is the mother, is the son, is the lover, is the friend. Uh, Krishna, all the roles come originally from Krishna. The the main, there are many rasas or ways to relate to Krishna, to God. And as you acquire intimacy, as you acquire knowledge and intimacy, then this, this develops even further. So um, in, there are different planets in the spiritual world. It's, it's like, you know, you get the different upgrades, right? And, uh, and they're really premium, the top level, is Krishna's own planet where he lives, which is called Goloka Vrindavan. In Goloka Vrindavan, the characteristic of this planet is that nobody knows that Krishna is God. Nobody knows. Or mm. cares. Or cares. Because they, they are in love with Krishna, so they couldn't care less. If, if Krishna is God, that's, that's nice, but you know, he is also my brother and my lover and my friend and etc cetera, etc cetera. of course in order to get to that level you have to go through the different gradations you have to first you have to understand like for example uh, in the Srimad bhagavatam i don't know if you saw these books there's a there's a whole collection that Prabhupada wrote you know 60 volumes so mm -hmm. well there are there are total a total of 12 cantos the cantos are divisions. And um, the first nine cantos are mostly descriptions of the material world and the interactions that take place between saintly people and God in the material world and how, you know, a description of the laws of the material world, of the uh, foibles and, and the things that you should do, you shouldn't do, etc., etc. And then it comes the 10th canto, which is Krishna's loving exchanges with these devotees. So in order to understand the intimacy that you may have with Krishna, you actually have to understand the material world first. So it is, there is no harm to call Krishna Lord because to us, uh, it's, there's such a dichotomy, there's such a difference right now. You know, the, there is unity and diversity, uh, but right now we are so apparently so far away. So this is the, the neck, the linchpin is the holy name. This is what can bring us back to this relationship where there are many choices. And this, we are individuals and we'll be eternally individuals and we will have the best relationship, the best suited to our temperament. And especially when we are completely purified of all material desires and material inebriaties. You know, well, we are in a, an intoxicated state right now thinking I am the body and this is, this is my neighbor and this is my family and this is my enemy and you know, all, this, all these things that are only pertain to the material world. So you have to raise above and you have to go step by step. There is a, there is a you know, you can't learn calculus unless you learn you know, uh, addition, subtraction, and division, and multiplication. It's, you can't just skip a certain, certain steps. So it is better to understand that Krishna is God. He's the father and the provider and the creator and the omniscient, omnipresent being, etc., etc. And as we make advancement, 
they can, then you can um, naturally, organically, this relationship will start to shift into a variety that ha will have more intimacy and less of the formality of it. So you can think of Krishna as your father right now, because if you admire your father, you know, and that's your role model, good. You know, Krishna is, uh, Krishna is actually the role model for your dad as well. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, uh, there was, there was one time I was, I was speaking with a couple, uh, kind of middle-aged, young, you know, thirties or so, uh, their son became a devotee in New York and I was talking to them, they just matter of factly about Krishna consciousness and about Krishna and so on. And they were quite absorbed and they didn't notice how uh, absorbed they were, that they forgot themselves as I was talking to them. And then more or, more or less they snapped out of it. Wait, we came to visit our son kind of to convince him that we are, you know, we are more important than whatever he's doing here. So, so they try to kind of counteract my diatribe, my soliloquy by saying, well, to us, the highest uh, expression in, in the world is to see um, Pablo Casals. Okay, this is, this is a little dated for you. It was a very famous uh, cello player from Spain from the 1940s, 30s, 40s, with great sentiment. He changed the instrument for good. And looking at the sunset while playing uh, Suite by Bach, and, uh, and a tear gliding down his eye. And I said, that's a great example, but I would like to introduce you, the person who gave those feelings to Pablo Casals and who also manufactured that sunset that made him feel that way. His name is Krishna. Imagine his feelings, imagine his sentiments, his sense of artistry. And he actually made Pablo Casals a better musician. He taught him how to play because Krishna is the ability in man. So mm. this, is, this is how you have to see it. You, know, you see your dad as your role model, but you have to see that if your dad learned anything, he learned it from Krishna. And how to be a good son? Read the story of Krishna and mother, mother uh, Jasoda. You know, Krishna play all, all sorts of pranks on his mom to increase her love for him. Because mm. mothers, mothers naturally have affection for the kids. And if the kid is naughty, you know, they, the affection even increase even more. And if he's loving. So yes, you should be loving towards your father, seeing your father as a role model, whose role model is Krishna. Of course, your father may not know that, but you should know. Mm. Great, yeah, thank you. That's yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the uh, for the question and comment. Yeah, of course. Anybody else who would like to take a pot shot at me? Yeah. Drew, I have a question. Like, sometimes you might be cooking and you put your hand in the. Oh. I'm sorry. You just muted yourself. Go ahead again. You might be cooking and you put your hand in the fire, but you don't see it, and the pain is a signal for you to take your hand away from the fire. So I was thinking that pain has a purpose that if we're going the wrong direction in the material way, we'll feel some discomfort. Or, and that's part of Krishna's mercy to get us to turn back to him. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I heard a, a very good example from my guru. He says, uh, he said once many, many decades ago that uh, we are actually constructing a new body for ourselves, for our next life. We are actually, because of the way we think, the way we act, we're actually shaping a new body uh, according to our specifications. And Krishna doesn't want that. Krishna wants us to go back to him, to just stop taking, you know, taking another birth after birth. So sometimes uh, we feel severe existential pain 
And he said, that's Krishna with a flamethrower burning our mental image of our next body. And it hurts like hell. But Krishna is doing us a favor so we don't have to take another birth. So yes, there is, a, there is pain associated with growth. Like, for example, um, I was, uh, when I was in um, elementary school, I was one of the smallest kids. Uh, I'm six feet now, but I was one of the smallest kids in, in elementary school. And then as I was uh, getting older, I started getting these fevers that uh, it was like a high fever with no other symptoms. Now, I didn't have sneezing, coughing, just joint pain and a, and a high fever. And my mother will measure me. You know, I, I don't know if the parents still do that. They put you against the, a door frame and they, they trace a, a line with a pen, you know, and they, they put the date on it. You know, this is how tall you were at a certain time. And after the fever, I have gained uh, half an inch or an inch or an inch and a half sometimes. So there was, uh, there was, a, and I, I felt a lot of pain because my body was stretching abnormally. So this is sometimes we feel this kind of pains, you know, that they're associated with spiritual growth. But when you when you get up from the bed of material enjoyment, then you're you have taller, you know, you, you can see a little better and you know, you left behind a lot more that what you that level didn't suit you anymore. You want to go to the next level. And that's, we should be, we should be greedy. We should be ambitious to make spiritual advancement. We should not settle down. Like in material life is, is um, what's the, what's the greatest achievement? To become a federal employee because, you know, they can't fire you. You get benefits. You don't have to do anything. You just have to show up, right? So this is, this is material life. Well, in spiritual life, you cannot be a, a federal employee. You cannot. You will, you will find it very troublesome. You get fired. You get demoted. So try to make spiritual advancement. Think that this is, this is not uh, going to last. This, is, this situation I'm in right now, don't, don't get too, uh, um, don't get too caught up with the, um, a bullion feeling of being, you know, having made some advancement because there's a lot more that should come. Now, okay, you you were successful. Like one, uh, I was at a seminar, I was at a Japa retreat, and I was able to chant a lot of rounds, and it was so easy. And it, you know, I I I kept chanting and chanting, and I, I was just pretty ecstatic. And I got almost to 100 rounds. I chanted 96 rounds and it was 9.30 at night and there were, the next day there were a lot of, lot of programs and seminars and classes I had to attend. So I could not stay awake all night chanting. And I was feeling great. You know, I didn't feel my body anymore. My mind wasn't bothering me. It was just wonderful. It flowed like anything. And the next day I had trouble chanting 16 rounds. I was just struggling like anything. So it's not, don't take it, don't take it for granted that, oh yes, I am ecstatic today and tomorrow I'm gonna be more ecstatic. No, tomorrow Krishna will send me, you know, a, a cement truck to stop you from thinking that you're great and you're wonderful and you're gonna start all over again. You, you're gonna get a flat tire in your spiritual progress. And then you have to just spend all the time lifting that humongous truck with a little jack until you get it running again. So that's, spiritual life is meant to make you strong. Uh, Prabhupada said, work now, samadhi later. And, and there was an old man that used to say that in Krishna consciousness, the pay is not very much, but the retirement plan is out of this world. We should, we should take that plan. This, we should retire to Krishna, Krishna's planet, not take another birth and get into the struggle again. So we have to decide everything as soon as we can. Do not procrastinate. Procrastination and spiritual life don't go well together.
And the suffering is temporary. It's temporary. You're not going to suffer forever. It's, it's not that kind of God's tough love. Not for you. Krishna treats you very well and gives you more than you, what you deserve. True. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So Matthew also asks, what is the etiquette of when to ignore an offense and when to give correction? I'm sorry, say it again. What's the etiquette about what? Of when to ignore an offense and when to give correction. Well, it depends on your position. Are you, have you been named the monitor of other people's life? Then uh, if you are not, then, you know, better stay away from it because it's, it's, there's a very good chance that you may commit an offense by trying to correct another one. So uh, even in the Old Testament, I think it says that uh, you, you see the straw in someone's eye, but you don't see a beam in your own eye. So you, you see that someone else is making mistakes, uh, but you don't see your own mistakes. It's, it's what, what they say that if you point at someone, uh, you're actually pointing with one finger, but three fingers are actually pointing at you. So you're always more guilty of offenses than someone else. If it is your duty, if it is your, if it is your job. I mean, if you've been appointed the warden of the holy name, you're just the, the, in charge of the, the prison and you have to tame the prisoners and keep them in line. Okay. Like I, I had a bad experience in that, in that sense. I, I joined the movement in Brazil. There were 40 devotees in the temple where I, where I was a new devotee. And they named me temple commander after three days in the temple. Now, I knew nothing about Krishna consciousness. I, have, I didn't read any books. And I had to tell, I had to engage uh, experienced devotees uh, in service, which I had no idea about. So I, had, I was appointed monitor, corrector, and reformer of something that I had no idea about. And I, it lasted for about three months. And, and I was very miserable doing that. Maybe Krishna wanted to cure me of my tendency to be a controller. Of course, he didn't cure me completely, but certainly took a bit of, a bit of the edge from it. That I, I want to tell everybody what to do, and nobody can tell me what to do. So, yes, if you're, if, if you're in charge of uh, that particular service, then, okay, do it. But do it with a, with a humble attitude that you're actually doing it like Bhakti Siddhanta, he, he said, I have the un, ungrateful and uh, most terrible service of having to correct all of you. You're so lucky that you don't have to do that. You see, you take it as a, as a punishment when you have to tell other people what they're doing wrong. Because um, they're not going to, most people are not going to appreciate when you tell them, oh, you're chanting all wrong. Your mantra is all, all muddled and, you know, you're, you're missing a Krishna or a Hare or you're not offering properly or you're not pronouncing Sanskrit right or you're playing the cartas wrong or you're, you're not a good father or whatever, you know, whatever you have to say. It's, it's a very, very terrible job to, to have to correct. It's, it's better to, to be in the opposite position where you take a humble, humble position and you just expect people to correct you and you accept it with a humble heart. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to tell me what I'm doing wrong. You're actually helping me out. But um, I don't know who asked that question, um, but you, you're welcome to correct me. There's another one. Sriya Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, be strict with yourself and lenient with others. Yes. Yes. That is, that is a good policy. 
just like the uh, Chanakya Pandit, I think, said, that he should practice religious austerities as if he were going to die tomorrow. And he should do business as if we're li going to live forever. Any other questions, comments, reflections? Should we go on to a kirtan now? Sure. Yes, that would be great. Thank okay. You. Certainly. Uh, okay. Let's. Uh, let me take the computer all the way to the piano since I'm by myself. I'm gonna. There will be no no drum and all the other stuff. You let me know if uh, if you can hear. Okay. How's the sound? Um, it's it's pretty good. It might be a little a, a touch loud. Um, it's it, it, it is too loud, you said? Uh, just a little bit. It might cause the mic to clip. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can fix that. Maybe I can put the computer on top of a cushion and muffle a little because it's right on top of the piano. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. 
wanted a little more um that was great thank you so much Prabhu. okay no problem thank you it was uh wonderful seeing you again and thank you so much for a wonderful class and kirtan tonight my pleasure thank you for tolerating me <laughs> and <laughs> hopefully if if you uh there are any other questions or comments, please, uh, you have my email, just send them to me. I'll do my best to address them. Okay. Let me um, copy that into the chat. Um, give me one second. Okay. I just copied Sarvama Prabhu's email into the chat, everyone. For any questions and uh, that will be it for us tonight because since we did announcements before before class um, thank you again everyone for for joining us tonight thank you again Sarvat Prabhu, for for leading us in class in Kirsten tonight um, we look forward to seeing everyone uh, back here again soon Hare Krishna Hare Krishna everyone we will thanks a lot Sarvatma. Thank you. Thank you for arranging this. Arrivo.